Hello, and welcome back to the Ask the Color Expert podcast. Today's special guest is Bobby D. Berard. She is the founder of Revolutionary Hair Academy. She is a team leader and senior educator and mentor for Jack Win Pro Hair Color and Products. Uh, we have connected through Facebook. Um, her past last few posts have hit me in all the feels. And I had heard wonderful things about her prior from my good friend, Bart, and I wanted to connect with her and invite her as my special guest. So welcome, Bobby. Thank you for coming and being on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I just love all of your posts. I love your podcast. The other day I was driving in and out of Austin and I just put your podcast on it. It just played one after the other and it was fascinating. I think it was uh, part one and part two of Jennifer with Jennifer Hernan. Is that how you say That's your last still name? the most listened to episode. I actually have Jennifer coming tomorrow back because oh. she, she kind of stepped away from hair completely. And we we both are kind of on the same path as far as where we are with our children and all those things. And I said, Jennifer, we need you back. You were the most listened to episode. So that's, that's really great that you're, I'm going to tell her that when she has. Yeah, it was awesome. (laughs) It was fun. I, I enjoyed it a lot. So that's great. So, yeah, I wanted to connect with you because in your post, I don't know if you realize how great of a writer you are. It's not easy to write things that are going to grab someone's attention, keep them engaged, not piss them off. You don't say anything that's like, oh, you know how the forums can be when you put your two cents in. So, <laughs> well, this is very sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Like you just, you, you made everyone feel seen and heard and they relate it to the content, but it didn't, it didn't poke anybody or fire anybody up uh-huh. about like a controversial thing. And that's a hard thing to do as someone who also educates and is brand free and all of that. I'm like, sometimes I really want to answer when someone asks a question, but I know what the backlash is going to be. So I'm much more comfortable answering on my own pages because I know that people chose to come there. Whereas on an open forum, when I'm one of 360 comments, someone will say something back nasty because, and to me, I've done enough life coaching and I've done enough therapy to know that it really isn't about me or what I'm saying. It's about the person who it's landing not well with because it's something that they're dealing with. So that helps. But as you know, when you have someone saying nasty, mean things, it's still, you get that instant like punch in the gut, whether you're, you know, spiritually aligned and, and able to handle right. uh, comments like that can be difficult. So, so welcome to setting yourself up for, for everyone's opinions. <laughs> and it's okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's funny. Cause you said that um, when I'm talking about teaching, when I'm like, I used to do a lot of train the trainers or educator training. And one of the things that we always talk about is the way that what people bring into the room and who they are when they come into the room, their body of knowledge, their experience behind the chair, um, who they are personally, where they're at in their life sort of comes in a little bit like um, remaining pigment contribution. I love that. If you look at it, that wh- how they come in is where they are. And the information that you give is going to be a piece of it, but it's going to land on everybody differently. They're going to internalize it differently. They're going to interpret it and then work it out in the salon very, very differently. And so when we're educating or when we're talking to people, being able to um, kind of be neutral in a way and be able to go in there and land on all of those different places is a, is a skill that I think as educators, we're constantly trying to get to. Absolutely. One of the things that um, people are constantly asking me for is drawings on head sheets because they're that type of learner. And I'm Uh so not that type of learner that it pains me to be that kind of teacher. (laughs) And I read a really good book when I started educating, especially virtually. Um, It was about the four styles of learning because as an educator, we tend to teach the way that we learn because that's how we would want to be spoken to. So I love that um, analogy with the remaining pigment contribution because it's coming it's coming in the room, whether you like it or not. And that RPC is coming in the air, whether you like it or not. Exactly. And, and, and with the RPC, you know, something that I start every class with at some point in the first 10 minutes, 
the phrase comes up where I say the most important thing that you can understand is that 50% of every formula you're creating is already existing on the hair. And I get these looks of sheer confusion, you know, that they're just like, I don't get it. And it's, it's such a simple thing, yet it's so profound and so, um, you know, new to people hearing it, that it's like, they can't even settle it in their brain to even use it then in their decision-making with formulation. So for me, formulation is probably one of the most difficult things to articulate as an educator. I almost feel like until they actually do the thing on ahead and see it come to fruition and say, oh, that, okay. Yeah, I, um, we were talking the other day in my group, Revolutionary Hair, and we were having a conversation about gray coverage. And I said, you know, it's funny, before we have a framework on which to place information, it's like a Christmas tree and it's like throwing all of the ornaments in a corner and they just lay in a big pile. We have to have the tree. We have to have the framework on which to put all the little bits of information. And sometimes I think people don't have that framework. So if they start to hear something and they don't have a place to put it or a place to hang that little bit of information, they just sort of stare blankly until they figure it out and get that. And maybe they'll go back and pick up those pieces that they got before, or maybe they need to relearn it again once the framework is in place. That's what I, we think, need to learn. I think there's a little bit of um, when they have to let go of something that's been so ingrained for so long, there's that resistance to, I don't want to change how I've done it, but I know I'm not having success with it. I think for me, that's a big issue with people, you know, someone will write to me that's in my membership and they'll say, I have this client, she's level five, but they give me the whole scenario. And I say, okay, I, this is how I would approach it. Step one, this, step two, this. And I literally, if they're really panicking and the client's coming in in an hour, I will literally give them a formula. You know, I'll say step one, mix an ounce of this and an ounce of that. Boom, 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 boom. And the next day they'll put another post and they'll put a picture of a not nice result. And they'll say, so disappointed in myself, you know, this isn't how it turned. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my fault. I gave her an exact recipe. What the heck went wrong? And I'm thinking, I know that would work. Like what else was there? Cause I'm not there looking at the right. hair and you and I know there's porosity and all these other things, right. texture, all the things. So I reach out and say, you know, Hey, Jill, what happened? Like I gave you that recipe. I'm really sorry. Like I feel terrible. And she'll say, oh no, I, I didn't do that. And I'll say, okay, what did you do? And she'll say, I did. And it's exactly what she did before she asked that didn't work last time. So then I have to have help her unpack that. Like, well, what was the reason that you asked me if you were going to do what you've always done, why even ask me and then go back to doing what you've always done? Because we know that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I think until there's that trust fall, of I'm in this membership. Elaine's been doing color for 35 years. She must know what she's talking about. If she does this full time, I need to trust and do it. At least I'll say to them, just do it in the back of the head. Do what I'm telling you in the back of the head. No, you're totally fine. Are they okay? Or can you hear them? They're fine. Okay. Do what I'm saying in the back of the head and do what you want it to do in the front of the head. And then when you're blowing her dry, separate her hair in the back and take a peek. And if it's great in the back, and not so great in the front, then next time do it all over, but you won't be in such a panic about it. So baby steps. Yeah, I think I think taking somebody, and I think that's one of the reasons that we teach the pieces and that you like teaching the pieces better than just giving a formulation because when we just give a formulation, they do have to do that trust fall and they have to say, okay, I'm just gonna put this on here without having any idea why or how it's going to work and just trust that it is going to work versus if they get the pieces of this is why you're choosing this part of that formulation, this part of that formulation, why you're choosing this developer and putting it on, they're able to to have sort of a sense of ownership of that formula. So that's why it's never like people will say, give me a formula for this. And it's, it's very, very difficult to do, but we do it sometimes because there is somebody sitting in the chair. My favorite it's, is it's when so like instant last minute, like I'm, I'm right. freaking out. She's in my chair. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I like what you were talking about. Somebody um, when they just believe what they believe. I love when somebody puts a level eight on and they say it didn't cover the gray. And I say, well, what is it? What did it do? Well, it was too light. Well, if it was too light, let's think about putting on a level seven. Well, I don't want to make it too dark. 
but a level eight was too light. But I don't, I don't, I don't want a level seven. No, I know you don't want a level seven, but the level eight. And so trying to convince people or, or not even convince, but trying to help people understand that, um, you know, people want to look, not a level. And we want a level so that we can kind of put a system to what we're doing, but that's a system to what we're doing. It, it has absolutely nothing to do with visually what we see. It's the same way I feel about when people say ash is darker than, and, and I say it, I don't want to say, I don't say it. I say ashes ash looks or visually appears darker appears, yeah. than, than gold. However, if something visually appears darker, it just is darker because we were, we're in the visual, like I didn't accidentally get it darker because I put ash on it. it. I didn't, I didn't think about that and I formulated it and I ended up with a look that was too dark. So people are looking at a look, not a level. And we tend to think in levels. And so kind of breaking down that barrier, I think is super important too, as we as we break free from those preconceptions that we have. I agree. And something that I see a lot of is misreading natural level. Someone will say, my client's at natural level nine. And I'm like, I'm sorry, do you live in Sweden? Because I've done this 35 years. I don't think I've ever had a natural level nine in my chair. Maybe if it was a four-year-old. Yeah, (laughs) four-year-old coming with mom. That may be a natural level nine. So I see a lot of that. And I think, Think about a GPS. If you put the wrong starting address in the GPS and put your destination, you're not going to get there. So same with the hair. If you're misreading what the level of the starting level is, and then think about where you're going. And then there's the person, you know, someone just wrote to me and said, I have a client who's a level three. You know, I want to make her an eight. What am I doing wrong? I'm like, what you're doing wrong is trying to make her into a level eight. Like that's my final answer. And people get so frustrated with me because they want me to be, you know, Insta famous, give them an answer of this magical unicorn formula that's gonna, you know, make it icy blonde from level three. And I'm like, if that's the kind of color that you strive for and you don't care that your client's gonna be bald in six months, then go for it. But hair was not meant to be pushed from a two or a three to a 10 or 10 plus, you know, it's just not good for the hair. So I um, had a, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 you go ahead. Well, it's funny. I had a client once who wanted me to push her, she had natural level two and she wanted to be, she wanted platinum highlights in the foils. And I said, you can't, we can't do that. Like, and I test stranded her. I showed her, this is, this is where it's dissolving. Like we can, we can go over the same highlights a few times, but we're going to degrade the integrity of the hair eventually. And it's just not going to be there. Well, um, my daughter was born. So this is how long ago it was. My daughter was born. It was 18 years ago. Uh, and she went to somebody else in the salon. And I got that nice phone call that said, oh gosh, you know what? I'm, thank you so much for your years of taking care of me, but so-and-so was able to get me to the blonde that I wanted. And I said, that's awesome. I'm so happy for you that you got the color that you wanted. And then six months later, she was back in my chair and she said, I don't understand how come all the blonde faded out. And we had to have the conversation about how blondes that is bleached doesn't fade it's out. Not fade your drain. <laughs> it all went down your drain because all of those highlights that were in there and she had a ton of naturally curly hair. So it wasn't like she was missing the hair. She really couldn't feel it, but she didn't see the color anymore. And I, I had to explain, you're not seeing the color anymore because well, we could have gotten you there, but we couldn't get you there and have it stay on the head. And it didn't stay on the head. It went down your drain. So if you want to approach it differently, I will go back to giving you the highlights as light as we can get them and still retain them. Don't you and love that- it though? It's so satisfying to see them come back and say, it really wasn't possible. I had a woman, I, I was training a brand new girl. This was like 20 some years ago. And it was just the two of us in the salon. It was a small boutique salon. So she's on the other side of the mirror. And this woman comes for a consultation with me. Uh, like a week before. And I said, it's just not possible. I'm sorry. You know, I won't, I won't do that to your hair, blah, blah, blah. She leaves. She's upset about it. She calls and makes an appointment with the the girl that I'm training and she's eager and excited. So she goes, Oh, brand new color client. Okay. Books it for an hour. And it's this big, you know, five, six hour. And then this was back 20 years ago where we didn't do five, six hour appointments. Now it's like a normal day. So she starts it. I'm busy doing my own thing. I don't even know it's the same lady. She starts it. It's a huge disaster. We were all there until I think midnight trying to, and I said to the woman, did you, did you think that I was telling you, like, why would I turn away your business? Like I'm a businesswoman. I want your business. I want to charge you. I want to be able to do it. Like when something's not possible, it's not possible. 
And now look at the mess that we made. It was somebody was getting married. It was a disaster, but there's always going to be that person that'll take it on. They'll think that they can create the miracle and, and make the client feel good about the decision. But in the end, it all comes down to, you know, your lady has 50% less hair and it's still brown anyway. I've I've had that conversation more than once over the years. I'm sure we all have where somebody asks for something. I will say, I'm not the stylist for you. I know there is somebody out there who will give this to you. I'm not the person who can do it. It makes my heart hurt. It makes my stomach sick. I can't push your hair to that level, but there's somebody that can do it. And sometimes uh, I was talking the other day with somebody, it's about aesthetic. It's about whether or not I see what's beautiful that matches what you see that is beautiful. And sometimes there's somebody else whose aesthetic matches you better. And I'm all for that, but that's completely different than it, it's physically impossible to get your hair there in a way that keeps it healthy and makes it be able to do anything in the future. Because if it is curly, it's going to be straight or frizzy or you know, it, do, it doesn't have to fall off to be a bad result. There can be lots of other ways that it just torments you for a long time because we made a bad decision with chemicals. Exactly. I, I read on one of the forums the other day, somebody was asking, she was out of um, 20 volume developer. You can let them, let them, let the dogs out. Okay. It's I'm going to let them It's going to make you too distracted. <laughs> so while she's letting the dogs out, somebody, um, wrote into a forum and said, I'm, I'm, I'm out of 20 volume. I have 40 volume and 10 volume. Can I make 20 volume? And they said, I was taught in beauty school that 40 volume and 10 volume makes 50 volume. And I was like, oh my gosh, we wonder why people have such issues with formulation when someone at the beauty school level is sharing that information over and over and over again with all of these different students that 40 volume plus 10 volume equals 50 volume. And so there's always those that like they just recirculate every Let so the dogs often. out. What happened? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was saying somebody was asking about like, how can I make 20 volume if I don't have 20 volume? And people were giving their two cents. And there was this whole argument where this person was saying, I was taught in beauty school that 40 volume and 10 volume makes 50 volume. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, these are the things that as now as an educator who educates people already licensed, like I can't catch people before they learn all this nonsense that's not true. And then they're so set and dug in because it's like teacher said, like they, they value the beginning teacher more than someone that they meet down the road. And they don't know the the background of it. Like my beauty school teacher never did hair in a salon. She went to beauty school, she learned everything. And then she became a teacher. So I'm like, I'm not going to ask her about a corrective situation. I'm going to ask a, a stylist who's been correcting hair for 35 years in a real world salon situation. You know, my beauty school clients were all the little blue haired old ladies that got the fancy full rinses. I didn't learn much corrective color on them. They were all gray. So yeah, it's, it's funny how we, we latch on to that. Like I, I picked up when you were talking about the, the uh, lightener situation, I picked up the swatch. I'm testing out these human hair swatches for quality And I purchased it in this really deep, you know, level three. So I was like, you know, let me make, first of all, let me make sure that they can be lightened because a lot of times they tell you they're great human hair and it's not, it's like synthetic or yak hair. So I put the lightener on and I went out to lunch and completely forgot that I was doing this experiment. So I I was like, I kind of think I left the house at one and I came back at like three. So the lightener had been sitting on there. Now we all know it's going to stop at a certain point and be dried out, but it was sitting for that amount of time. And this is the the lightest that it went, you know, that was it. So when someone says, I want to take someone from a three to a 10, you know, it got light enough to, to not be so dark anymore, but certainly not blonde and, you know, would need a lot more work to get to blonde. So I think, I think swatching, you know, taking the time to buy human hair swatches and playing around on a rainy day when you don't have a lot going on, just like putting lightener on that swatch, set your timer for 15 minutes, see where you get in 15 minutes, see where you get in 20 minutes, see where you get in 25 to, to visibly watch those levels of lift that you and I, as educators can talk about mm-hmm. five, six, seven, eight, nine. We can talk about, talk about, talk about it. I have these level finders that I sell and use for my education. And I can show you the different levels, but until you physically watch a piece of hair on someone's head, go through those levels and understand what warmth lives where and why 
that's where all the meat is of formulation. Right. Being able to see it and watch it happen and get your hands in it. It just internalizes it in a different way. You were talking about hair school. I have to give a shout out because I went to Citrus College in Glendora, California, and those instructors were incredible. And I will tell you, Mrs. Merkel, she was our hair color instructor. She did that. She took level three swatches and our project for hair co the hair color section was to bleach out each of the hair swatches to different levels of lightness and then to dye back. And we had to leave where we started, where we bleached out to and dyeing back. And we had to do that whole thing so that we learned how it goes through the stages of lightning and then how to re-put that pigment back in and get yourself back to where you were to start with. And I just thought that was a great project. And I feel like, uh, Albert Graciano, he was one of our haircutting instructors as well. I feel like they were just so into what they were doing. And I think culturally, some schools uh, just sort of lose that spark, but a lot of schools really do keep it. And again, it goes back to the kids don't have any framework yet. So they're getting a lot of good information. And they don't necessarily know where to put it because I don't know that I knew, I really understood what I was doing with those swatches. But later when I did see it again on hair, I flashed back to, oh my gosh, I remember when Mrs. Merkel made us do that. We were so mad. We were so frustrated trying to get it to exactly because she had control swatches and we had to bleach them up to those exact mm, controls. I like that. It was crazy. That's awesome. But that's all it takes is one passionate person to share. Um, I think the, the issue that we run into now is, you know, people get so, it's like information overload from social media. Um, they'll see a TikTok video or a quick Instagram thing where it's completely out of context of anything else. And then they go, oh, that person does it and they're famous and they have, you know, 2 million followers. So I'm going to do that. But they didn't see steps one, two, and three. They went right to step four and they're like, wait, why didn't that work? And then they go to somebody else and then they go to somebody else. So I always say to people, find someone that you look up to and respect and you really like their work. You, you like how it turns out. You like the aesthetic of it um, and try to really link up with one strong mentor so that you don't get overwhelmed and confused. Because if you take three different balayage classes, as I did, <laughs> you keep looking for the one that resonates with you. But each one will tell you the polar opposite of the last one. And then you're like, well, what, what is right? The fact of the matter is not, none of them are right or wrong. And that's why we're artists and we can make it our own. So I think right. sometimes people get the artist mentality and the, oh, this is my way and I'm sticking to it. They confuse the artistic freedom with the foundational things that are needed in formulation that I think placement and final result is the artistic freedom, but fundamentals of the color wheel and all of that stuff, you just can't skirt around to your point about the level eight that didn't to totally blend the gray. Like it's, you know, every manufacturer in their instruction says for hundred percent gray coverage, stay at levels eight or below because right. nine and 10 aren't good. They don't, they never told you it was gonna completely cover it. But how many people use a color line for 10 years and have never looked at the book or the, uh, instruction sheet, you know, everybody wants to wing it and then backpedal when something goes wrong and make a reel. I don't, I do not know how to make reels. You're talking about this TikTok. I'm, I'm right with you. <laughs> I would like to learn to make them because I know that they're cool and they're fun. And sometimes I like to watch them, but you're right. You cannot take a 30 second bite of something that somebody's done and then translate that behind the chair because you just don't have any construct for what, what that was about. So learning our tools, understanding them, knowing like alkalinity and oxygen. I, I always say I'm completely in love with hair, like the hair structure, the strand, all the way into the interior of it and understanding oxygen and alkalinity and how they work together and how they work with texture and color and different ratios of melanin. And those things are the building blocks that create all of that artistry and other artists in other places, they understand their paints, like people who, who sculpt, they understand, you know, the steel strength and the softness of each of the things that they use to sculpt that stone and what kind of nuance it's going to make. So I think a lot of times people feel like the artistry is, um, I don't know, impeded because of the technical and really the technical frees the artistry in a right. way that if people really dove into that technical side, they would see what kind of freedom they would get for that artistry. So 
I think that we need to embrace that as, as hairdressers and understand that all of those amazing things and the people that you see that do really great work on TikTok or Instagram that have really strong clientele that are booked and have people look at the health of the hair. There's a really healthy, shining hair that consistently is on there. Those people are doing a lot more than just those, that 60 seconds of, or 30 seconds. I'm not even sure how long they are. <laughs> I know, I really right? Need to do a it's, I send, I'll take a picture or I'll do a short video and I know what I want to say. And then my daughter's my virtual assistant. So I'll be like, here's the video. Here's what I want to say, do a reel and put it on my page. And she's just like, oh, can't you learn this? You know, like she's so annoyed by it, but hers always looks so much better. Um, so that's, that's why we give birth to our children, right? So that they can make us look good on. on uh, Mine social. will not help me. She always says, no, you can't go on TikTok. <laughs> she, she doesn't want you on there. You can't be on TikTok, mom. No, it actually is one of those. I wrote my um, my goals for 2022 and, and goal number two was to start doing TikToks because all the changes in the algorithms with Facebook, my entire audience and where I find all of my you know, tribe is from uh -huh. Facebook. And because of the algorithms, everything has changed. So I, I can't totally rely on Facebook anymore. I have to step out of my comfort zone. And as far as paid traffic, TikTok is like a third of the price of Facebook ads because everybody's over on TikTok. So that's, that's a reason enough alone, Bobby, that we both have to learn it because. So I have to tell you this really interesting thing. So I'm driving my son home. He's 16. I have him and his friend in the backseat of the car, and he's talking about his social media marketing class. And he says, you know, I mean, no offense to you, Miss Bobby, no offense to you, but I feel like what's happening in social media marketing and what they're teaching us is for old people like you and not for people like me. And I, so now my ears perked up because obviously we're in a social media world. And I said, well, what do you mean exactly by that? And he said, well, they keep talking about these paid ads, these sponsored ads and how to create them and how to do them. And I don't think any way you do them is going to work because if we see sponsored, we scroll past. Interesting. And then he said, and he's 16 and he's a boy, he's a football player. Like this is just sitting in the back of my car. He said, word of mouth is the way I'm going to choose things, not a sponsored ad on TikTok. TikTok is a way for people to get to know each other. And very and that, interesting. So I said, hey, do you mind if I use that? Because I wanted to talk about that with my team as well, because it was out of the mouths of babes. These kids are so ingrained in the technical world that it is something completely different and they don't want to be sold or if they are like, they want relationships built for real and they don't want to feel like they're being sold through this social platform that they have. And he was, he was pretty clear that word of mouth is still the way to go. Which I thought so them sharing something that's interesting, they'll share mm -hmm. your reel. But as soon as they see that it's a sponsored thing, they want no parts. Right. Good to know. Good to know. All right. I thought it was interesting. He just, that was his take on his social media marketing classes that it wasn't keeping up with the times and that with that really you needed to be giving content that they wanted to share with their friends, not content that you thought they wanted to see. That's very interesting. I, I got a uh, punch in the gut recently. I was taking a class on hair photography because I'm so terrible at getting the after shot and the lighting. And I, I have the photography lights. There's like, um, I can't remember what they're called. It has like the softbox, softbox lights. I gave up the ring light. I'm like all high tech with my lighting. I do it all. And I, I upgraded my phone to get a better shot. It's still not great. So I was like, I got to you know, hire this person to teach me. So I did her whole class and I didn't love it. I didn't really get much out of it, but she's in our space. She's a hairstylist. And she said, you know what, before we got on the um, call, I checked out your site because I wanted to see like your brand and everything about you. And she said, I know that you're, I said, my frustration is people need me when they're in their twenties, but they don't look to me as someone cool enough to give them advice because I'm 54. So I said, it's frustrating because I'm getting them when they're 40 and they've been pretending to understand hair color for all of those years and not making a great living and not living a great life and barely getting by. Then all of a sudden they go, where have you been my whole career? And I'm like, I've been here. You just weren't interested because you were too young and I'm, I'm not cool. So she had said to me, no offense, but your branding is very 40 and up. 
like the colors of your brand. Like you see this behind me with my book. She's like, you have bright colors and you wear bright colors. And she's like, that's not what 20 somethings want to look at. And I'm like, and then I say to my daughter, oh my gosh, do I have to completely change who I am to get a message to people who need it, who don't know that they need it? Is that the way the world works? So to your point, in spite of my very 80s branding, um, I do get a ton of word of mouth and that is how my tribe grows and how, you know, the best way that I can reach people. But it really is frustrating because in order to actually target that demographic, I have to have succulents and a macrame swing and the same Instagram that everybody has. I'm like, that doesn't speak to, it's pretty, but that's not, you know, I don't want to be like everybody else. So I just keep plugging along and doing my thing. And I'm like, if they're, if they're ready, they will come. And if they're not, they'll find somebody who's fabulously succulent it and pink and beige and wears a hat and spins around on pictures and all of those things. And they'll, they'll get what they need from, from elsewhere. So what is your biggest frustration as an, as an educator? Oh my gosh. I, I think my biggest frustration as an edu educator for me is finding time, like still working behind the chair and being able to find the time to create content that I want or to share things that I want to share. Uh, that's super frustrating, but also it is, it is trying to learn to traverse the world in which the young people do live. I mean, TikTok and Instagram, I'm on them and I do, I am on TikTok. I have actually, I think I've done one, I've done one TikTok and Instagram. I have an Instagram, but I'm not into the reels and that sort of thing yet. Um, and you're talking about, you know, visually what they want to see. I think that, I think that for us, because I'm 53, uh, so we're, we're the same age. I think that it's really going to be about connecting with them on a genuine level because the other thing about they they like all the you know the macrame and the and the beigey and that that those very neutral tones which are gorgeous visually gorgeous but they're also very much um, we used to be that when you walked out onto the salon floor you were a certain persona and you sort of created this this professional environment. And I think those barriers are kind of broken down today because social media infiltrates every piece of our life. And so those 20 somethings, I think are, I think, I don't know, are less interested in the way our social media looks. And they're much more interested in if we're talking to them in a real way, or if we are putting on that, that persona, because I think that I definitely feel felt for a long time that I had to step into a role when I was educating and learning to kind of pull back. And that's one of the things I love about working with um, my team that I work with now is that I have a lot of young people who invest back in me. So everything that I give to them, they invest back in me as far as helping me learn to connect and learn to sort of loosen up. I think I've, I've broken free of a lot of chains that I built up over the years of being a hairdresser through the nineties and what we were supposed to be and how we were supposed to behave. And today everybody meets everybody where they're at and there's very little compartmentalization and there's much more individuality. And that is, that is something I've had to relearn. And I'm so grateful to to the young stylists that have poured that into me and shown me that it's okay to sort of loosen up and break those chains a little bit and meet people in a real and raw way. I love that. I absolutely love that because it is so true. Things have changed so much and we were so ingrained in like our dress code and, yes. you know, being professional. And what the first job that I had, we had to call clients, Ms. or Mrs. and their last name. So I was 21 and I would have to walk up front. And if a 19 year old girl was my client, I would have to call her Ms. DeBerard. Hi, Ms. DeBerard, follow me, you know, come back, come follow me. And I would have to walk behind them and let them walk and show them the restroom. And this is where you're going to do this. And then everything was so buttoned up. And now it's like, you know, some of the outfits that I see with people that what they do here. And I'm like, oh my God, I feel like one of those old women going, I would never leave the house looking like that, let alone show up at work like that. So there is some freedom in that, you know, in, in my manual of my salon, it was, you know, if you have, um, you know, facial piercings, take them out before you come into the salon, because our clientele was so conservative. And I watched in a salon, where I was working, where we had to do the whole Ms. Mrs. thing, this other colorist was the most talented colorist 
one of the most talented colors I've ever known in my entire career, like really, really amazing. And she just had this really um, edgy, you know, she put Kool-Aid in her hair. She had the shredded stocking. She would literally rip her stockings up in the, in the car before she came in the fishnets and combat boots and piercings everywhere. And the women who came to that salon were terrified for her to do their hair. They looked at me I was so conservative, you know, blonde hair, pink lipstick, all the whole thing. And they'd say, I want her to do my hair, but she did my hair. The one that they were afraid of did my yeah. hair. And they're looking at my hair saying, I want you. And I'm like, this is so screwed up that they're judging her quality and, and whatever um, skill level of a colorist by what she looks like. And she had to fight I think she got out of hair, actually. I haven't talked to her in years, Gosh, but I think she was uh, so exhausted by being so judged. She was like, I'm not going to be who I am not to please these women that I don't know to do their hair. Like th there's something very wrong with that. Right. Um, so, and there, there was plenty of salons back then that she would have fit into, but she happened to train there and really wanted it to work because it was a high-end salon. The pricing was high and she wanted to um, to make it there, but just her, her appearance just would not allow her to connect with these women. And now to your point, it's like the wild, wild west, you have like, you know, the conservative, <laughs> right. the, the tattooed, the pierced, the whatever. And, um, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we've, we've evolved as a, uh, as a culture in general to be more accepting, to let people be, because nothing is worse than an artist trying not to be themselves, stifling that creativity by trying mm -hmm. to be someone that they are not for sure. Yeah. So, so any kids following in mom's footsteps? Do you have anybody that's, uh, Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's usually, that's usually the way. Both of my kids are athletes. My daughter is a sports photographer as well. And oh, she cool. plans. Yeah. She would love to work for a sports team, um, doing some sort of either social media marketing real. I mean, she's a great photographer. So if she could get down on the field, football, doing photography, that would be her dream. My son is all football all the time. And so he, he wants to do something with football, whether that be coaching. I think he's so cute. He's so charming. He knows every fact he's, he's just a genius. When, when you're sitting there watching football with him, he can tell you everything that's about to happen, why it's about to happen, what person was drafted when, and what they learned in college that they're going to bring to the field right at this moment. And I kid you not, he's right every single time. So I think he should be a sportscaster, but he wants to be a coach and down on the field. And she, you know, she says she'll, she'll take pictures of sports if she doesn't end up in the PGA. That's awesome. Yeah. Both of my kids didn't want any parts. My daughter ended up here um, we moved to another state and we were leaving the salon and her, um, she managed a yoga studio and they were closing. So I was like, look, this is perfect timing. You can have yeah. your own business. You're managing people. People are people. So whether it's you're managing yogis or hairstylists, it's stressful, you know, managing anybody is stressful. So I said, just give it a shot. And she's doing great. She's in her, in her third year of having the salon. And so That's she awesome. accidentally fell into it, but it's different for her because she's not a hairdresser. So she had the training on how to be a great marketer, how to be a great manager. Like she's able to do all of the things that most salon owners are so exhausted by being behind the chair, like yeah. you were saying yourself, um, that you don't even have time to, to really dive into all of those things. So it ended up working out really well. But when I would ask her when she was younger, both of them. I was teaching my son how to do a clipper cut when he was in high school to see if he wanted, I could see him being a barber. I think he would love it. Um, but now neither, neither had the, uh, the bug. I started, yeah. I started having it in fifth grade. So I thought maybe some, something was in the genes. <laughs> well, my, my husband's a barber. I don't know if you know that. Oh no. So okay. We worked together. We've worked together for uh, like since 92. Wow. So, uh, he, yeah, neither kid. I think they were just so sick of watching us do it. My daughter, the minute I get home, she won't even touch me until I go change. She's like, Oh, is there hair on you? I can't take it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not, not their cup of tea. No. Oh my gosh. Well, I could talk to you forever. Um, so I know people on here will want more of you. They want, they're going to want to see your wonderful post that I was bragging, but now the pressure's on for you to get your, get your writer's hat on and really, uh, right. oh, really right. blow us away. So how can people find you and get in touch with you? I'm pretty much, I'm Bobby DeBerard, B-O-B-B-I uh, DeBerard on every social media platform. So 
Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Okay, that's not every, but those three. Uh, TikTok, you're not, you're going to find one. You're gonna, you'll find one TikTok if you go there. But I am on Instagram. I have Revolutionary Hair Academy on Instagram. And then Revolutionary Hair is a group I have on Facebook. So they can find me in all of those places. Most of the, the writing and stuff that you're talking about is on Facebook. And it's kind of interspersed throughout. I should, I'm probably on Instagram. I should probably start collecting that there somewhere. Definitely. What you need to start a blog. That was the other thing I was going to, I wanted to be a writer at one point in my life. So thank you for saying that. that you really can tell. I mean, writing is very difficult as someone who has to write a lot of emails and a lot of copy. Um, it's really difficult to, because you want to, you want to keep in mind who's reading it. It's not all about you writing it. It's the people that are reading it. So you have to constantly right. be talking to someone that you don't know who you're talking to. Um, but you do a beautiful job and you got thank my attention. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for thank having you so me. Much. Yeah, I just love, I, like, I love listening to you. I love reading your posts. I love watching your videos. Your videos are amazing and so informative and so to the point. So I was pretty excited that you asked me to do this. Thank you. Awesome. You're welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you everyone for listening. Make sure you reach out to Bobby and we will see you on the next one or you'll hear us on the next one. <laughs> and my dogs. You'll hear us and my and, dogs. And the dogs. I love them. <laughs> you are so mad right now. <laughs>